Hi, we are the Tay family, and today's reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, through to chapter 5, verse 2, reading from the New International Version, UK. Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing to you with these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true God in the springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labour and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the saviour of all people, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat older younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Let's just pray for Ian as he comes to speak to us today. Father, we thank you for Ian. We just uh, thank you that he's um, taken the time to prepare the sermon today. And we just pray that you would speak through him, uh, that we may hear from you today, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And thank you to the Say family for a wonderful reading. I'd just like to uh, start by saying we are truly, truly breaking new ground today. Not only are we announcing the launch of the Restore digital um, location, but also I'm preaching in a plain shirt and not a check shirt. Thank you. <laughs> These things are important. They really, really are as we look at the word of God. Um, at the moment, we're working our way through 1 Timothy. I hope you're really enjoying it. I'm finding it really, really helpful as a, as a series. And I think I'm finding it really helpful because it's reminding me that the word of God is there to call us back into order. And if you know some of the context of the church in Ephesus that uh, Paul is writing to Timothy to address some issues, the church in Ephesus was actually in a real mess. And uh, I find that quite helpful as well, because sometimes I think we have an idealistic picture of church. And uh, we have this idea that, uh, you know, in the Bible, it says the church is, is, a, is a family. And we have an idea that we're all going to be sweet and loving uh, to one another. And because we follow Jesus, there's never going to be any issues. Well, uh, let me just give you a little bit of a wake up call. Um, the reality is in life, most families are dysfunctional. You don't have to think too far about your own family, dare I say it, on a Sunday morning, to recognise some dysfunction. Just think about Christmas and the arrangements and who you want to spend time with and who you don't. You hit into your family dysfunction. And the reality is we are all broken. 
And we're all finding our way with Jesus through our brokenness. And the result of that is there will sometimes be mess in church life. And that's okay. That's okay because Jesus is bigger than it and Jesus wants to help us work our way through it. And as we work our way through it, so we come to a place where we grow in character and we grow increasingly more into the likeness of Jesus. And what was happening with the church in Ephesus, uh, which is what the uh, 1 Timothy is written to, um, the church in Ephesus had started off really well. You can read the backstory to it in the book of Acts. And uh, Paul planted it on one of his missionary journeys. And uh, the church prospered, and then it hit a whole load of problems. And they hit really bad problems. So for one thing, their teaching went right offline. So I hope you're sitting there with your Bible this morning, checking that I'm online, because that is a really, really good thing to check that we're on track and we're following the word of God. So their teaching went right to pot, their leadership went right to pot, Um, actually their finances went right to pot as well. And God in his grace sent Timothy to go and put things into order. And God in his grace sends us one another and godly wisdom to help call us into order. And so 1 Timothy chapter 4 is all about how we handle some of those tricky issues. I know for many of us, the last 18 months has been really tricky. It's been really tricky because we're dealing with a pandemic. It's also been really tricky because we've been isolated from one another. It's also been really tricky because our emotional resilience has been really thin. And the result of that is, for many of us, we've had a shorter fuse. And we've ended up reacting in ways that maybe normally we wouldn't want to. And one of the reasons we want to get church back together again on the 18th is so once more we can come back together and we can say, oh, I'm part of a bigger body. Oh, praise God that I'm part of a bigger community. Praise God there's a way that I can deal with the pain and the hurt and the struggle of the last 18 months. And I can come back into a worshipping community. And together we can find the grace of Jesus to find our way through those difficult issues and to find our way to the place of restoration and healing. I was listening to uh, a great talk this week from John Mark Comer. I listened to quite a lot of uh, the talks from Bridgetown Church. I really, really recommend that. They do a lot of stuff on healthy spiritual formation. And I think if ever there was something that the church needs in these days, it's helpful helpful spiritual formation, helpful, helpful discipleship teaching so we grow more into the likeness of Jesus. But the talk I was listening to this week, he said he was having a conversation with his grandmother. And his grandmother made this wonderful quote to him. And she said this. She said, I come from a generation that mended broken things. I come from a generation that mended broken things. And when he said it, there was a real weight on that word because the reality is our generation doesn't mend broken things. We just bin them. Whether that's a phone that uh, there's the latest version of, we don't even wait till it's broken. Uh, there's a new version of it and we want to get the new things. So we bin the old thing or we sell it on eBay or whatever we do to kind of recycle it. You know, this week the government passed a uh, new piece of legislation that uh, manufacturers of white goods have to sell spares beyond five years to give you the option of replacing your wa- of repairing your washing machine or your fridge freezer rather than just binning it. But our generation comes uh, with the mentality of we won't mend something when it's broken, we'll just bin it. And it's, sadly, it's not just true about consumables, uh, but we have that mentality about relationships. The divorce rate is higher than it's ever been before. Family breakdown is higher than it's ever been before. Why? Because we come to a ceremony and we say, I will love you for better or for worse for richer, for poorer, in sickness, in health. But really, when I stand there, I'm saying, for better, for riches, and in health. And if things don't turn out the way I want them to be, then I've been the relationship. And that same mentality has seeped into the Christian culture. And we end up in the place that I join a church community. And remember, when Paul writes about the church community, he calls it a body. And a body is joined to one another. But we join a church community, and after a little while, we think, oh, I don't like the teaching here. I'm just going to disconnect and go somewhere else. Or, or oh, I've, I've got offended, or I've got hurt. 
oh, I better have a new start. And because Jesus loves me, then he'll wash me clean and I can have a brand new start in a new place. Let me tell you, that never works. If you bin one relationship, you will take away the debris and the herd of it and bring it into another relationship. If you bin one relationship, it will be in part because you haven't dealt with character issues and you will take those same character flaws into a new relationship. If you bin one church because you've got upset with them, you will take that same offence into your next place and it will undermine you there as well. Can I recommend a really good book to read on this? It's called The Bait of Satan by John Bevere. And he talks about Satan's biggest conspiracy is to get us to take offence and not deal with it because when we take offence, it brings division and separation. And that was exactly what the enemy was doing in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let me tell you, we are called to be one in Jesus. We're called to be the most forgiving, gracious community ever on earth. And with all of my heart, that is what I want us to be as Restore. That's why I believe God's called us, uh, uh, given us a name like Restore, because he wants us to be a church that believes in forgiveness, that believes in reconciliation, that believes in working through differences in opinion and, uh, and relationship and coming to a place of togetherness and healing. And there's lots of godly wisdom in 1 Timothy 4 about this. And uh, so we're going to look at it. We're going to look at it in two parts. To begin with, Paul writes some truths to Timothy. And there's some truths to help Timothy live a godly lifestyle. So one of the ways of uh, dealing well with tricky issues is, is to avoid them in the first place because we've learned how to build a good life in Jesus. The second bits of it are all to do with how you deal with tricky situations. So we're going to look first at some of the instruction that uh, Paul writes to Timothy to keep him on course, some of the keys. Uh, there's, uh, um, what he writes in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is this. He says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. And again, just to note that phrase, how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, how one ought to conduct himself in the household of faith. And then he goes on. So having talked to, to Timothy about Timothy needs to conduct himself in the household of faith, he then encourages Timothy to call the other believers into line. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of sound doctrine, which you've been following. And again, just note that phrase, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ. And the word of God is there to be used to point out to us the areas of life where we need to see transformation. In 2 Timothy, uh, there's a phrase that's well known. It talks about all scripture being God-breathed, all scripture being uh, given by God. And it says it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Note, it doesn't say for easy listening, for entertainment, or to make me feel good about life. It says all scripture is there for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I bet you're really excited about the word this morning, aren't you? So, but it, we've got to understand, you see, and I know I've said it a few times recently, but it's so easy to take the bits of the Bible that we like and the bits of the Bible we agree with and say, oh, I'm following Jesus because I like this bit and I understand this bit and I can do this bit. And it's the bits of the Bible that we don't understand. It's the bits of the Bible we don't find comfortable. It's the bits of the Bible that speak into the areas of our life that still need work on them. It's those bits we need to focus on. It's those bits we need to not shy away. We need to put our lives under the authority of the word of God, as opposed to putting us over it and saying, oh, I like that bit. Oh, but that's just out of context, isn't it? But we so need to come to the place that our life is shaped by the sword of the spirit, by the cut of the word of God. 
And so Paul writes to Timothy and he says, let your life be shaped by the word of God. And then as a good leader in Christ, you call the body back into order. And so what does he say? What's the advice he gives to Timothy in terms of making sure that Timothy's life is in order? Well, there's five bits of advice. Number one, he talks about what Jesus warns us about. What Jesus warns us about. In verse one, it says that he says, the spirit explicitly says in later times, some will fall away from faith, ex- uh, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. What Paul's saying to Timothy is he's saying, don't be surprised about what's going on in the church of Ephesus. This is actually what Jesus warned us against. And one of the ways we can make sure that we're on target, that we're on course, is to read the bits of things that Jesus warns us against and make sure we're in order on those issues. What does Jesus warn us against? He warns us against unforgiveness. He warns us against, he says in the latter days, there'll be all sorts of crazy teachers and prophets that will come. But he says, don't judge their words. Look at their lifestyle. It's by their fruits you will know what's true and what isn't. In the parable of the sower, he talks about the thorns that choke out the good life. And he says, it's the deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of this world. And Jesus gives us a checklist to test our hearts with. And if we're going to be in a right place with God, we've got to uh, every day let our hearts be tested by that. So today, is there anyone that you're angry with? Is there anybody that you haven't forgiven? This morning, is your wealth and your finance your God? Or is Jesus your God? And it's letting the word of God go through those bits of our heart that help draw us back into alignment. And so Paul writes to Timothy and he says, what did Jesus warn you against? Oh, false teachers. Well, put their doctrine back into order and we can do exactly the same. The second thing he picks up on is what Jesus says about key life issues. And I love this as well. Paul writes, he says, have nothing to do with worldly fables Fit only for old women. That's not a sexist statement, by the way. Um, Have nothing to do with worldly fables. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Can I say something just really, really honestly? I've been shocked by some of the poor level of discipleship within the life of Restore over this last season. And I've had some people argue some things to me that I think, where on earth did you get that from? You certainly didn't get it from the word of God. It's so easy to take our guidance on lifestyle from the culture when actually we're called to be counter-cultural, to be lights into the darkness. And that means we need to live a different way. I'll give you some examples. Consenting behaviour between two adults is perfectly fine. Culture says that. The word of God says absolutely the opposite. Look at politics. What you do in your personal life and your private life are two separate things and they don't matter. Come on. Who was shocked that the press made a furore over Matt Hancock breaking socially distance guidelines, but nobody made the outcry over the fact that he was cuddling someone else's wife, deceiving his own wife, and doing untold damage to his kids. Because nobody's allowed to challenge behavior like that, and yet the word of God does that. And if a man will deceive his wife, He will deceive the nation he's leading and the constituency he represents because it's a character flaw. We cannot take our guidance from the culture. Do you know, this word of God says that joining together with someone else in sexual unity is a precious thing that creates a oneness and it's a holy thing. Yet the culture says, if it feels good, do it. 
We have to, if we're going to be light in the darkness, take our guidance from somewhere else. And we've got to take seriously what Jesus says and make sure when we come out with this stuff that actually we're quoting the word of God, not just what's seeped in from the culture. Let me tell you, this current culture is rotten to the core. Tells lies that celebrity is what makes you happy. Money is what makes you happy. Jesus says there's more blessing in giving than there is in receiving. Jesus says, don't build up treasure on earth, build it up in heaven. Jesus says, what profit does it gain a man to win the world, but to lose his soul? And they're words to be taken to heart, to let seep into and cut the very inside of us, to make us more like Jesus, so that then we can be the signpost to say, but there's a better way of living. There's a better way of doing something. There's a better way that we're called to live, which is God's way. But we've got to know God's way if we're going to point people back to living God's way in God's world. Which means we've got to take the warning seriously. Which means we've got to take our guidance from the word of God. Third thing that he says is he says, embody what you believe. Embody what you believe. I love verse 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness. Timothy was a young man. So it was hard for a young man to call older men into, back into line. It was a difficult thing. But he says, let no one look down on your youthfulness. But rather in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith and purity. Show yourself an example of those who believe. Do you know, in our communities, in our workplace, at the school gate, in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith and in purity, we're meant to stand apart. We've got to embody the truth that we, that, that we believe. In John chapter 14, Jesus says to the disciples, he says, the prince of the world is coming, but he has nothing in me. Jesus knew the enemy had no ground in him because he'd given his ground, he'd surrendered it to his heavenly father. And he'd said, not my will, but your will be done. And we need to do the same. Fourth point, I told you this would be a fun morning, didn't I? <laughs> Fourth point is we need to focus on what Jesus has called us to. Again, Paul writes to Timothy, until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Don't neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance and the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Do you know the easiest thing in the current climate is to get caught in all of the conspiracy theories. I love the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation has been subject to more conspiracy theories over the last 2,000 years than any other book of the Bible. But do you know what the main point of the book of the Revelation is? It's to point us to Jesus and to inspire us to take the good news of Jesus around the world. I don't know the pathway to the end of the world. What I do know, though, is Matthew 24, 14 says, this good news of the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a witness to many, and then the end will come. The Antichrist, I don't know. I don't think it's Biden. I don't think it's Trump. Um, ah, <laughs> so tempting to talk about vaccines and uh, everything else from China. Do you know what? I don't think that matters. What matters is that we're in love with Jesus, we follow him, and we radiate him to the world around. What the enemy would love to do is he'd love to distract and deflect us. And our main task is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, spirit, strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This good news of the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a witness to many, and then the end will come. You want to see Jesus return again in glory? Well, let's radiate Jesus. Let's preach Jesus in the way that we live and in the words of our mouths. And that's the way that we will be on course and on track. And the last piece of advice for Timothy is keep going. Keep going. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself 
and for those who hear you. When I went to visit uh, Jackie Pullinger 18 months ago in Hong Kong, at the end of the time we spent with her, someone asked a piece of advice. And they said, what piece, what, after 50 years of serving the poor and the vulnerable and the addicts in Hong Kong, what would be your major piece of advice for us today? And Jackie's words were, keep going. Keep going. And she said, we've had many days where we could have given in. We've had many days where it seemed too hard for us. We had many days that we thought, I just can't do this anymore. But we made a decision of the will to get back up and to keep going. And if you will just keep going, eventually you will come to a point of breakthrough. Because, you know, if you read the word of God through to the end, guess what? We win. Jesus is victorious. So all we need to do in those moments when we feel like I've had enough, I can't do it anymore, is we need to dust ourselves down. We need to get up and say, I know that Jesus is bigger than this. I know that Jesus has the victory and I'm just, just going to go and keep going. So some really clear upfront words of wisdom that Paul writes to Timothy in terms of making sure his own life is on track. As a church, if we will heed those words... We will be on track for everything that Jesus has for us. Having said that, there were still messy issues that needed dealing with. And even if we do our utmost to be on track, we will still make mistakes sometimes. And other people will make mistakes. And we will have to deal with some of that mess. And uh, the Bible is really helpful in terms of uh, giving us some very practical teaching about how we go about handling tricky issues. And uh, one of those is to do with the, the how we do it, the posture we take in relationship to do it, and the other is to do with the practicalities of the what we do. So just a little bit about the how we do it. And again, this is here at the beginning of 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Do not sharply rebuke an older man but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. And as I say, this was, this was a hard ask of Timothy because he was a young man having to deal with weighty issues in a complex church. But Paul says to him, he says, clothe yourself with humility and in love... Find a connection point that enables people to hear your heart. And you see, when we go to uh, tackle a tricky situation with someone, they won't be able to receive our words if they feel that we're against them. If we feel that we're criticizing, if, if they feel that we're putting them down, if, uh, if they feel like, uh, like we're taking the high ground, people won't be able to receive it. And so Paul writes to Timothy and he says, they need to touch your heart. So if it's an older man, honour him. Look for the good, respect the good. And in that context, then bring your appeal to him. If it's a brother or a sister, come alongside them. Don't try and lord it over them. And remember, uh, Jesus criticised the uh, Pharisees for lording it over people and not serving them. So come with a serving heart. In 1 uh, Peter chapter 5, um, uh, Peter writes, and he says, clothe yourself with humility to one another because God's opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And when we seek to put error right or put conflict to an end, uh, when we have a fragmented relationship, the way to do it is in a spirit of humility and a wanting not to be right, even though you might be right, but to win the other person back into relationship. And that is the way of Jesus. Do you know, Jesus was willing to hang on the cross and be wrong that we may be made right. And sometimes to make offence, to get it sorted, we need to be willing to take the place of saying, do you know what? I might be wrong and I'm willing to own where I'm at fault and where I am wrong that this situation might be put right. And that's clothing ourselves with the humility 
that Jesus tells us to, that we might be able to see reconciliation and become part of a generation that mends things. So if that's something about the posture, what are the practical steps that we need to make to handle tricky situations, and in particular, situations of conflict and find healing? Well, I've got four simple steps that come from the teaching of Jesus in the Gospels, and they're this. Number one, do it quickly. Do it quickly. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks about a worship service. This morning, we're at a worship service. And he says, when you get to the altar, this morning we were singing, oh, come to the altar. He says, when you get to the altar, and read the words on this as well, he says, if you think your brother has something against you, so not you're angry with your brother, you think your brother has something against you, Jesus says, leave your offering at the altar and go and sort out the relationship with your brother. Now listen to that. Leave the offering at the altar, go back, sort out the relationship with your brother, and then come back and continue with worship. Do you know, for some of us watching today, at this point, you would do well to pause your TV and to go and ring someone or write to someone or deal with a situation that you're out of order. And do you know, that is what Jesus tells us is a godly way of living. He says, don't park it for a moment and continue with your worship. Why? Because that would be hypocrisy. It would be singing one thing but living another. He says, deal with it. And so can I say, number one, if you have an issue in a relationship with someone else, number one thing that Jesus says is he says, act quickly and put it right. Paul writes in in Ephesians, doesn't he? He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Why? Because if, if we leave it, it festers. And if it festers, it grows. And you know what? There's possibility for another offense to land on top of that. And what originally started off as a small thing then becomes a huge thing. Someone wrote to me recently and they said, we don't want to be a part of your church anymore. It's not my church, it's the Church of Jesus, but we don't want to be a part of Restore anymore. And they said, because we're upset about this, but actually we've been upset about that, that, and that. And I wanted to say, well, why didn't you talk about that, that, and that? So that, that, and that didn't add to that and become this. And you know what? The that, that, that could have been dealt with really easily because most of it was misunderstanding. But what they'd done is they'd held on to it. And we say, I'm not ready to deal with it yet. But actually, when we make that choice, we nurse our grievance and our hurt. And then it festers. And then it grows. And then we end up being taken out of the loving community that God called us apart to be. Jesus says, deal with it quickly. Number two, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 is a great chapter. Um, The end of it talks about where two or three are gathered. There I am with you. And it's in a context of unity, but he actually specifically talks about how you deal with disunity and disagreement. And he says, if someone's got something against you, he says, go and see them and see if you can win your brother. So number two, do it face to face. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be a part of our digital location. (laughs) That means you can't be a part of our Facebook group. That doesn't mean that can't work for you. But there's something about being in the same physical space of someone else that you can hear their heart, that you can re-engage hearts, not be misunderstood, and come to a place of reconciliation. So number one, do it quickly. Number two, do it face to face. This morning, if you're watching this, if you are out of sorts with Restore, I would happily meet face to face with you to deal with that issue. In fact, I would love, I would welcome the opportunity to meet meet face to face with you to deal with that issue. Why? Because it has to be our commitment if we're going to be a church that mends broken things. Do it face to face. Number three, Do it one-on-one. What Jesus talks about in Matthew is not telling the world about it, 
but not the person concerned. We're so good at that, aren't we? Aren't we so good, or is it just me? Aren't we so good at moaning to other people about what we're upset about? Aren't we so good at telling other people what we think ought to be done in a situation? Aren't we so good at giving our, office, at our opinions? Do you know, Jesus says, don't do that. He says, go and talk to the person. I, I trained with a guy who was really, really helpful on this. He, he said um, he got really upset with someone. And so he went to his church leader at the time. And he started sounding off about this person, how they'd upset him. And he said his church leader just said to him, come with me. And he was talking to him, kind of following him. And he took him into the hallway and he picked up the phone, because in those days we didn't all have mobiles. There was actually a static phone in the home. He picked up the phone and he started to dial. And this guy said, I was just telling him you know, all the things I was angry about and all the way I was wound up. And then I suddenly stopped and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm ringing the guy that you're upset with. And he was like, why are you doing that? And he said, because if you're not prepared to tell him, you shouldn't be telling me. Wow. And he said it called it into line. Let me tell you, when was the last time you moaned to someone about someone else, but you didn't talk to the person that you were moaning about to put it right? Can I just say that is sin? And damages the body of Christ and doesn't look like Jesus. Can I also ask, when was the last time you tolerated someone moaning to you, but you didn't challenge them on why they weren't put in the situation right with the person concerned? Let me tell you, that is sin. What you tolerate, you have to live with. And if you tolerate someone else moaning to you about someone else, you're going to tolerate that person moaning about you to someone else. Do you know, Jesus has called us to something bigger and something better than that, a loving community that protects one another, that cares for one another, that is adult enough to deal with our stuff in the right place. So, do it quickly, do it face to face, do it one on one. If, uh, and fourthly, if you can't then resolve it, get help. Talks in Matthew 18. Jesus says, says, go to the church. That doesn't mean that you email Jody and I, and in the notices next week, we uh, give a list of people that have got issues that need to be put right. It just means get someone else that might be able to be an arbiter or bring some wisdom to bear that might enable that situation to be resolved. Why is this important? Because oneness is what God has called us to. And Jesus says it's by our love one for another that the world might know we're the disciples of Jesus. Let me tell you, oneness it doesn't come cheap. But unity is something to be honoured and celebrated and worked for. In, in Romans, Paul writes and says, um, do everything that you possibly can, as much as, it's, as much as you are able, to live in peace with everyone else. And you can't always bring reconciliation because sometimes the other person isn't willing. But you know what? You can do every bit that you possibly can to work it through. And when you do, it honours Jesus. It celebrates the work of God. And it marks us out from the world. Because we're a community that believe in reconciliation. We're a community that believes in restoration. We're a community that believes in forgiveness. And that should be what marks us out from everyone else. But to be that, I need to deal with my issues and deal with it in the right place. I've got one more slide just to put up. You've probably heard this before. This is helpful, I think, in terms of the use of social media. Never try and reconcile your situations in a public forum. Before you post on social media, or before you talk to someone, or before you do anything else, is this true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Or is it kind? I hate conflict working itself out on social media 
And normally it doesn't work itself out on social media because it's not face-to-face, -face, it's not personal, and it's not kept between the individuals concerned. And it never goes well. Listen, we're called to something bigger and something higher. And Paul writes to Timothy to call a church back into godly order. This morning... Where do I need Jesus to speak, to call my life back into godly order? Because that's the way I will grow into the likeness of Jesus.